All right, um, guys, uh, what I've got for you also is I've got one per family. Let me tell you what I've done. I've updated your notes I gave you last week. I incorporated last week's notes into this week. So you can look and see if there's a thing or two I might have left out of last week's. But Arthur, let's see, you, let's see, Deacon and uh, Zayden, you guys come up here. Come on up here for a second. I want you to hand these out to folks. One per family. I've got about 20 of them. So one per family. And this, and why am I doing this? Here's why I'm doing this. Thank you, gentlemen. Aren't these gentlemen fantastic? Um, the reason I'm doing this is because this is, unfortunately, this is such a controversial subject. And, and for years, I, as you guys know, uh, I didn't believe, for years I didn't believe this part of the scripture. That's about the best way to say this. And then for years I did, but I didn't preach it. So now I'm in phase three. I'm telling you, man, the Holy Spirit's showing up. You guys better get ready. The power. We're getting power surges. Okay. Yeah, well, no, with the ground would be shaking if we are in Georgia. Yeah. You guys know that there are three levels of rain in Georgia. There is just hard, there's just rain. Then you have gully washers. And then you have chunk floaters. And, uh, and so uh, in Idaho, we just... Barely have a mist. Yeah, it's a mist. Uh, occasionally it rains hard, but not, not occasionally. Just, just occasionally. All right. Baptism with the Holy Spirit. Now, you've got to go way back. Now, I, I'm going to do, so, do something also. You'll get some more pages next week. I'm going to go back, and I'm going to put the pages in there where we talked about how Jesus was baptized in the Spirit. Now, that's not in there. This is just a combination of last Sunday and this Sunday. Then next Sunday, there's going to be a little bit more. Okay? So I want to read the entirety of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now, we'll, I will tell you, this is not exactly where we're going to start this morning. But I want you to hear this in its entirety. Okay? Okay, follow the way of love. Remember chapter 13, he was talking about the love, about love. Follow, you know, he's talking about love is the greatest thing. So he says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries in his spirit. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather you speak, you, that you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. Now, brothers, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you? unless I bring with you to bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy, a word of instruction. Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, such as the flute or harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will you, well, anyone know what you're saying? You will be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I'm a foreigner to the speaker, and he is a foreigner to me. So it is with you. Since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. For this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, and I'll also pray with my, with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I'll also sing with my mind. If you are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving, since he does not know what you are saying? You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants. But in your thinking, be adults. In the law, it is written, 
though men are uh, through men of strange tongues and through the lips of foreigners I will speak to this people but even then they will not listen to me says the Lord tongues then are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers prophecy however is for believers not for unbelievers so if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and someone who someone who uh, do not understand or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everyone is prophesying, he will be convinced. He will be convicted by all that he that he by all that he is a sinner, and he will be judged by all. And the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. So he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, "God really is among you." What then shall we say, brothers, when you come together? Every one has a hymn or a word or of instruction a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. If anyone speaks in a tongue, uh, two or perhaps, or, or at the most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For if, all, if, if, you, for if you can all prophesy in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. As in all the congregation of the saints, women shall remain silent in the churches. Amen. <laughs> they are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is, disgrace, it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only people it has reached? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I am writing to you is at the Lord's command. If he ignores this, he himself shall be ignored. Therefore, my brothers, be eager to, be eager to prophesy, and do not forbid speaking in tongues but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Now, I wanna, I'm not going to cover this. I just want to go ahead and just say something to you. Even this, this admonishment on women, I want you to turn to with me to, uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, excuse me, 11. Go back to 11, verse 4. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head just as though her head were shaved. I don't want to get into the, to all the requirements there, but I do want you to know that even Paul says in the very same book that women can prophesy. So again, there must be something going on with the women that uh, he's admonishing them not to say anything in this church. But I want to get that out of the way before we go because uh, I'm not going to cover that uh, this morning. The next two weeks we're going to be doing this. Baptism with the Holy Spirit. There is, there is a baptism with the Holy Spirit. So the answer is yes. There, I, I really believe there is a baptism with the Holy Spirit. Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I want you to think immersion. Sometimes this is just a, a vocabulary somatics thing. Think of, of, of being immersed in the Spirit of God. Think of being filled with the Spirit of God. If the baptism word is, makes you feel a little spooky, don't use it. I don't care what you call it, just, just, just let it happen. <laughs> when are we baptized with the Holy Spirit? We're going to talk about that this morning. How am I filled or immersed or baptized? How does it happen? We're going to talk about that this morning. And, and if we get to it, and I think we might, we'll talk about the question of speaking in tongues. Are tongues real? If so, what are tongues? Are tongues the sign of the baptism? Do all Christians speak in tongues? You know, the reason we go, we're going to go through these together because they're associated together, uh, speaking in tongues and being baptized in the Spirit. Uh, when were people in the Bible baptized in the Spirit? Let's take a look at that. People in the Bible were baptized in the Spirit when they were together seeking. That's what happened in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now, this is something very similar uh, and, 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 and process and procedure that I was involved in when I was, uh, when God touched and healed and filled me. It was a nine, ten day uh, uh, process, uh, a prayer meeting, if you will, of, of just Bible teaching and prayer and the Holy Spirit working. Uh, and I want to do something very similar here because I love the idea of us spending some extended time in prayer together. 
But they, that's what they were doing. They were just seeking God together. As in Acts chapter 2 verse 1 through 4. Some people were filled with the Spirit or baptized with the Spirit with the laying on of hands. We saw this in Acts chapter 12. Uh, excuse me, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 9, and Acts chapter 19. These, in these three cases, the, the folks were baptized with the Holy Spirit with the laying on of hands. Uh, and then during the preaching of the word, and that's in Acts 10, 44. We've already covered all this, so I'm just laying it out there for you again. Just going right down, I should be going right down your sheet. So people, listen, so here's the idea. People were baptized in the spirit at different times and different places with different circumstances. Uh, it's not, it's, it's, it's very much like salvation. Some of us were on the road to Damascus and lightning struck, and some of us were in the quietness of our, uh, of our room. You know, it's, it's kind of like salvation. It happens, you know, when it happens, and it's not always the same thing. You know, I want, let's talk about spiritual innocence for a second. In each of these cases, people were open to the Lord. They didn't know what was going to happen. Just concentrate on Ephesians 5.18. Be filled with the Spirit. They didn't know what was going to happen. They had no idea what was going to happen. You know, and I, and, I, you know and, and I know we've got all this church history and we've got our own personal histories and our own traditions and the things that we've been raised with and what we've come to think to be true. But you know, but I want to seek God with the spiritual innocence of a child. Just coming to Him and saying, God, just touch me, feel me. Just fill my, my soul with your presence and with your spirit. I love that song you guys sang. I wanted to do it about 12 more times. Let's talk about receiving the baptism with the Spirit. Receiving the baptism with the Spirit has everything to do with two factors. One, the desires and the conditions of our heart. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the writer of Hebrew reminds us that God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. I know a lot of people are just casual observers and casual seekers of God. And they don't get all this stuff about, about the Spirit. And they don't get all this stuff. You know, you know those people, you know, you can get so heavenly minded, you can't be any earthly good. You ever heard that one? You know, you know can I be honest with you? I've never met anybody like that. Never met anybody too heavenly minded. Matter of fact, if you are getting heavenly minded, you're doing the most earthly good that can be done. Because what's happening is you are, you are you're, when the Holy Spirit comes and gets a hold of you, it causes you to walk like Jesus walked. And Jesus went around feeding people and healing people and, and, and meeting the people's needs and preaching the Word. I mean, I mean if you're going to be filled with the Spirit and if you're going to be filled with all of heaven, matter of fact, I pray that every one of us are filled with all of heaven. And if you're not any earthly good, you are not filled with heaven. <laughs> Secondly, we place ourselves where people are. In other words, where we place ourselves and who we're with. In Acts 17, 28, the Apostle Paul made an astounding statement while preaching in, uh, in uh, Athens. He said, in him we live and move and have our being. He was trying to help the people in Athens understand the very nature of God and who He is. Guys, we place ourselves in the middle of people who are living and moving in the presence of God. Then you become more like Jesus. So I want to tell you something. If you want to receive the baptism of the Spirit, it has everything to do with the condition of your heart and then where you're placing yourself and with whom. You, here's, basically, here's the way I just kind of say it. You've got to want it. You've got to want to be with people who want it. And you've got to want it with all your heart. I mean, really, seriously. You, you've got to want it with all your heart. Well, how to be baptized or immersed? How are we baptized or immersed in the Spirit? First, again, there's no procedure in the Scripture. Okay? Like there's no... There, we do know that in salvation that we have to confess our sins and receive Jesus as, as Lord, believing that He is God and that He came and died for us and that when He rose from the dead, it, you know, we, we confess our sin, His life becomes ours. But it's, and exactly how it happens, there, it's, it's all different with each and every one of us. The same is true with the baptism of the Spirit. You've got to immerse yourself 
in spirit-filled teaching, preaching, and worship. You've got to immerse yourself in spirit-filled teaching, preaching, and worship. That's what happened in Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 48, when Peter was preaching to a bunch of Italians. You know, the Raymond Ramon family, that, that crowd. You know, Cornelius. Remember Cornelius, Raymond, Robert? <laughs> I'm picking on you with the TV show. Uh, but it was a group of Italians. You know, and, and, you, and they were just immersed in spirit-filled preaching and teaching, and, and the Holy Spirit just fell. It just fell on them. Immerse yourself in the Word and in prayer. And, I, and, and there's a key word here, alone. Alone, by yourself. This is where the Apostle Paul was for a couple of days in Acts chapter 9, 17 through uh, 19, before Ananias showed up. He was immersing himself in, in, a, in, a, in, in, in the presence of God alone by himself when Ananias showed up. You do know that, a Paul, that, that, that Saul of Tarsus at that time had no idea Ananias was coming until the Holy Spirit said something. Ananias didn't know what he was doing until the Holy Spirit said something. I want you to see in the book of Acts how the Holy Spirit just moves on people who are seeking him and the Holy Spirit directs them in the direction they should be going. How God speaks. You look at Peter and Cornelius. Remember, God showed Peter a vision when we studied that. He showed Cornelius that Peter was coming. You know, God's working on both ends. God's working on you, and He's working on where you should be. He's already working and preparing things there. You know, and until we are just immersed in the Spirit, and we begin to get in the Spirit... Then we began to be able to see and know what God is doing. I really believe if we're having trouble understanding God's will, it's simply because we're not, a, we're not availing ourselves to hearing God. Because I believe God through His Spirit is speaking to us. We need to immerse ourselves in teaching, preaching, and worship that's, that's Spirit-filled. We need to immerse ourselves in the Word and prayer alone and asking God to fill us. And then we need to immer you need to immerse yourself together with other believers for the purpose for waiting on the Holy Spirit. And that's in Acts chapter 2. They were just there waiting on the Holy Spirit to move. And I want to tell you, don't seek an experience. Seek Christ. Don't seek a gift. Seek the gift giver. But however, in your seeking of God, expect Him to do something and expect it. It will be some type of experience. It will be something to where you know God is moving and God is having His way with you. And then just let God do His thing. Just let God do His thing. Now, here's some points to remember. And this first one is huge. Make sure you are, you are a Christian. Make sure you have the life of Christ. The Holy Spirit cannot move within a dead spirit. You have to be alive in Christ. 1 John 5, 12, John just kind of said it, just kind of, he was just kind of blunt. You know, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. You're going to learn tonight when you come back we're going to be talking about our mentoring program and how God is going to be using our mentoring program here and across the state of Idaho. And you're going to learn through your, in your mentoring program, it's the very first lesson that you're going to go through in the mentoring program is what does it mean to be a Christian? And, 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 and you, can, you can use two words. The first one is life and the second one is submit. When you're becoming, a, you're, you're, not, you're not becoming a part of a denomination. You're not becoming a part of a religion. You're becoming, you're, you're, what's happening is you're dying to your old self and you're receiving the life of Christ. You know, and where there is no life for the Holy Spirit to empower. <laughs> In other words, seek Christ. And make sure you have his life. Just understand there are no set patterns. We are simply commanded to be filled. Don't look for a process. Don't look for a procedure. 
Just look, just get your attitude and your heart right. Confess your sin. We're going to look at just a little bit Ephesians chapter 4, 29 through 32. And then we don't make it happen. We let or allow it to happen. When we stop quenching the Spirit and we stop grieving the Spirit, if, you're, if Christ is in you, if you stop quenching it and grieving it, it happens. So you're not trying to create something to happen. You're trying to get out of the way and let it happen. Now, quenching, and, let's talk a little bit about what it means to quench and to grieve the Spirit. Quenching the Spirit is what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, when he simply says, do not quench the Spirit. Now, if you look at what that word quenching means, it means to extinguish the fire or things on fire or to suppress or stifle divine influence. You're quenching the Spirit when you're putting out the fire. That's what you're doing. And so, and, and, and then secondly is grieving the Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, Paul just simply says, do not grieve the Spirit. Here's what grieve means. The definition of the Greek word behind grieving is to make sorrowful, to affect with sadness, to throw into sorrow, to offend, to make one uneasy. In other words, when, you've, when, the, when, when the Spirit is what we're talking about here, you're grieving the Spirit you're make, when you make the Spirit sorrowful. When you bring sadness. Boy, I like that second part of that definition. You're throwing the Spirit into sorrow. To offend, to make one easy. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like this. We work a whole lot with the folks that come out of Pastor Tim's drug and alcohol rehab program. Boy, we, when we go to them before they're in the program, during it, and we're here for them afterwards. And I'm going to tell you something. I can't tell you how many times I've been thrown into sorrow by people who have been saved, who say that they've come to know Christ. But then as soon as they get out of that program, they go, they go right back to the life that they left before. You know, you know, it's, it's, it throws me into sorrow. Now, you see, if I experience that much grief, just imagine what God feels when He looks at us. And, he, and, and, and I just don't want God to feel sorry for me. I don't want God to look at me and all the potential He's given me and look at everything that He wants me to do and look at me and just, Oh, Gary, if you only. You know, I, 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 I'm kind of dreading when Jesus comes in a way. I know you're thinking, you're kidding. I, I'm going to get before God and I'm going to fall down on my face and the first things that I'm going to do is, is going to hit me about everything God wanted to do through me down here that I was unwilling to let His Spirit do through me. And I think for a while I'm going to be, how I'm going to experience the grief that God had when I walked on earth. And I can imagine that that grief is going to so paralyze me that I'm not going to be able to get up off my face until Jesus comes and lifts me up. I like that song. When we stand before Him, you know, what's it called? Uh, Mercy Me. Uh, will I dance before you, Jesus, or my knees? You ain't dancing. I think all of us are going to, that's the reason the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And I think you can add another one and every face is going to, you're going to do a face plant. Pow! Right on the ground. Because how are me and you going to be able to do anything else in front of an almighty God? Whoa, I'm going to feel, whoa, God. I, and I realize I'm a Christian. I know that, but there's, I, I just don't want, I don't want God to look at me. And, I wanted him to say, well done. I don't want to look at me and say, if you only would have. Man, let's stop quenching the Spirit. Let's stop grieving the Spirit. There's something I, I want to share with you, and I want you to understand my heart. I saw a sign the other day over here at uh, the donut shop, Davis's donut shop. It says, don't be so open-minded that your brain falls out. <laughs> Did anybody see that? Yeah. 
I thought that was pretty cute. I'm not asking you to be so open-minded that your brain falls out, but I am asking you to be open. I think God is asking you to be open to things that you've never thought before. To experiencing things you've never experienced before. To go places you've never been before. You know, Star Trek. Really, seriously, do you know why your Christian life is so boring? Because you keep going back to the same boring places and experiencing the same boring things and, 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 and walking back through the same boring path. And, you know, and, and I get it. You know, you're thinking, well, I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm so thankful that you're saved. You know, but, you know, I'll tell you something. A lot of people say, follow Jesus because you might die tomorrow. I'm telling you, be baptized in the Spirit because you might live tomorrow. You need the power of the Holy Spirit in your life today. Today. And if you don't know what that means, that's fine. It's just to know this. Part of my being filled was walking with Lewis Gregory for three and a half years, try, being convinced that he wasn't leading me to some type of Holy Spirit Ringling, Ringling and Barnum and Bailey Circus program. You see what I'm saying? I know, I know this sounds crazy, but I had to learn to trust Lewis before I learned to trust God. Because where is this guy taking me? But yet I kept going right back and I kept going right back to the same dead-end places and the same dead-end routines and the same dead-end beliefs. I kept walking right back into my captivity. I kept walking right back into my old habits. But I was afraid of what might happen to me if I followed this man. I mean, like, what did I have to lose? My wife was already telling me she was going to leave. She was going to take my children. I was going to lose my... I mean, what was I afraid of? I'm telling you guys, we can be more afraid of what we think God may do in our life than what Satan is already doing. And that is a lie straight from the pits of hell. Now look, I am not trying to tell you to put blind trust in me. I am not telling you to check your brain at the door. But I am telling you, that those of you that choose to walk into the path of enlightenment by the Holy Spirit are going to be the ones that's going to end up overcoming everything that's been eating your lunch your whole life. So I'm telling you, loosen up! Let God do something new in you. Let that life that He gave you become real and become alive and powerful. I just got to preaching, sorry. <laughs> Why are we not filled with the Spirit? You ever wondered that? Now, you may have a reason other than what I'm listing, but this, was, this is pretty exhaustive, I think, our misuse of the Word to deny the power of the Holy Spirit. I think one of the biggest things we do, and I, and I guess I'm talking about my own experience, it's not going to be today because I'm looking at the clock because I want, I want you bright and bushy-tailed and I want you really here when we go through 1 Corinthians 14. I don't want anybody going, what, 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 okay. You know, but listen, but seriously, we, I, had, I used 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 to prove that there was no working in God in things like tongues. And I've used the book of Acts to prove that there was no more filling of the Holy Spirit. There were no more miracles. Believe it or not, I used the very Word of God to deny the power of the Holy Spirit. I think it's our misinterpretation, misapplication of certain dead segments of church history. I want you to know the very same people that are going to tell you that the gifts went away in, in the Middle Ages, so did evangelism. The church almost died, except for small pockets of people that kept it alive. It almost died. It was the church that led the world into the Middle Ages. 
So don't let a misinterpretation, a misapplication of certain dead segments of history fool you. Our own personal traditions and memories. Uh, Cindy watches cooking shows on Saturday morning. I may have told you, and one of them she does is this lady from New York, and she's, she, 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 she's okay. She's not my favorite lady. I'm usually sitting there on the couch trying to get some stuff done for Sunday, and and, and Cindy's watching these cooking shows, and occasionally I'll look up and see them. But she's, I, I caught her saying something the other day that struck me. She says, we're, we are, I'm, I, do, I create traditions with my grandchildren because out of traditions come memories. That is very good. Listen, I want you to, those of you with kids, start creating traditions in your home that you do over and over and over again. Because, and, and do those things over and over and over again that you want your children to remember the most. Because believe me, if you don't create things to do over and over and over again with your children, you're already doing things over and over again and with your children, and most likely, they're not good for them. Just remember that. The things you're doing over and over and over again are impacting your kids. And most of what we're doing over and over again, we don't realize, but that's the things that's impacting their memories. Does that make sense? Now, let me tell you, man, this is getting, uh, it's getting close to raining in Georgia. <laughs> this is a Georgia rain right here. This is one. We hadn't got to gully washer yet. All right. Uh, let me say this. Cindy and I were talking one day, and, 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 we, and we, I don't can't remember if she made the statement or I made it, and we said, but tongues is so disrupting. No, it's not. In our experience, tongues is disruptive. I, I, Lewis took me places where tongues were welcomed, were not disruptive, and were a major part of the worship service, and God showed up. Tongues is only disruptive if you're not being around it. Do you make, see what I'm saying? My traditions and my memories, oh yeah, in my Baptist church, if someone was in tongues, we'd kick them out. It had been disruptive, all right. You'd had deacons escorting that guy out the door. But listen, I'm not kidding. It, you know, I can tell you, I can, you know, you know, I can show you in the Bible where everyone in the room spoke in tongues and violated 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And it was welcomed. And God spoke. People were saved. God added to the church. Guys, all I'm asking you to do is to step outside your personal traditions and memories and just follow the Word of God. Just take it for what it's worth. Take it for what it says. The same Apostle Paul that told them, and we'll get to this next week, about have one or two or three at the most and speak at the same time, went to Ephesus, laid hands on people, and 12 guys all at once started speaking in tongues. Paul violated his own rule. Let's don't, don't use the Scripture to back up your own personal traditions and memories. Use the Scripture to say whether my traditions and memories are right or not. Okay? I think it's unconfessed sin in our lives. Let me tell you something. I believe we don't understand what's all standing in between us and God. You know, unconfessed sin in our lives. Our habit of not seeking the Lord daily. I, don't, I think we're not filled with the Spirit because we don't want it enough. We don't desire it enough. You know, I, I talk about the relationship, my relationship with the Holy Spirit, like the relationship with my wife a lot, because it just, it's, because it's a very, it's a very applicable illustration. What if I said I wanted every bit of Cindy, but then never spent any time with her? What if I said I wanted to be filled with your presence, I wanted to be, I want to be where you are, but then Everything in the world, I would, in, my, in other words, I, I'm everywhere in the world but with her. Does that make sense? I, I know, 
I can show you my ring and tell you I'm married. I know I can, in my spirit, I can tell you that I'm married to Jesus. But for some reason, I want to do anything and be anywhere and talk about anything else but Jesus. But I tell you, I am married to Him. Being filled with the Spirit is making Jesus the real Lord of your life. It's making Him, it's, it's allowing Jesus to be able to, see where you're able to seek Him with all your heart. At number five or six, whatever that is, my screen's cutting it off, there it is. The lack of passion on our part to seek the Lord with all our heart. The atmosphere in our churches is not conducive or welcoming to the Holy Spirit. Guys, please understand, we're not going to talk about tongues forever. But please understand, we're not going to talk about being baptized in the Spirit, the doctrine of it, and trying to show you where the Bible talks about it all forever. But these are not, but, but, this, but these terms of being baptized with the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit of God is not just something we're talking about because it happens to be where we are in the book of Acts. These are going to become major staples, major convictions of this congregation. Why? Because you and I need it in order to become everything that we were saved to do. So Holy Spirit, you are welcomed here is not necessarily the song we'll sing, but that will be the theme of our songs. Because it is through the power of the Holy Spirit that God changes our lives. Well, let's, let's wrap this up this morning. and Look at Ephesians 4. And let me just ask you some questions. We're not going to read Ephesians 4, but I'm just going to go through some questions from Ephesians 4. You got the paper, so you can go home and read it. These are just some simple questions. Are you living as the world does? What I mean, oh, I don't drink or smoke. Or, that's not what I'm talking about. The world lives as though Christ doesn't exist. The only thing, the difference between some Christians are and that is that we believe in Jesus, but then we live as though Jesus doesn't exist. Are you sensitive to the Holy Spirit? Are you being sensitive to the presence of God? Check the desires of your hearts and attitude of your mind. Do you truly desire holiness and righteousness? Because one of the things we're going to learn next week or the next just depends when I get to it is that one of the signs that you're filled with the Holy Spirit is holiness and righteousness. Are you lying? Are you angry? Well, not right now, but I'm talking about when you get home. I'm talking about what lies do you live in? What, what, what temperament, what state of anger do you live in? Or do, you know, I'm not saying you do, but are you? Is there anything that you are giving the devil a foothold of in your life? Is there any place in your private life? And the internet, you can have a big private life. In your job, when you go to work. Are you the same person there you are when you're here? I mean, guys, is there any foothold that you're giving the devil? I'm going to leave right there. We're going to leave it right here. Now, you're taking this home. I'm hoping it becomes somewhat of a devotional guide for you this week. And I'm always up for discussion. Well, Pastor Gary, I've always felt like this is what that scripture meant. Well, you know what? You could be right. You better tell me. Wow, I never thought about this. Call me. Let's sit down and let's talk. Because I want to get it right. Don't you? And, you know, and, and I want you to go over that checklist of questions. And if you're truly desiring to be filled with the Spirit... Talk to your husband or your wife. Talk to your parents. Call me. I'd, lo I'd love to go on a journey with you. Let's get together. Let's talk. Let's move in the Spirit together. I had a basketball coach. His name was Wayne Dubos. Coach Dubos passed away a couple years ago now. And Coach Dubos basically, 
I got my lifestyle for coaching people from Coach Dubos. Coach Dubos, strong Christian man. He did not put up with cursing or you know, on a varsity basketball team. Believe me, that's, that's tough for some guys. He didn't put up with drinking, drugs. He didn't put up with anything. He didn't care who you are. You broke the rules, you're off. And I mean, he was serious about that. And we all knew he was serious about it. Because my sophomore year, we had two seniors that were going to take us to the state tournament and possibly to the title. They got caught drinking the, the weekend before the first game. And Coach Dubos kicked off two All-State forwards. He kicked them off the team. That's what made me a starter. We did not go to the state. <laughs> I saw we'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, that thing kind of kind of gets something over that. All right, listen carefully. Here's what I'm saying. Coach Dubo said this. He says, guys, I can't get out there on that court. And I can't make a pass for you. I can't play defense. I can't make a shot or a free throw. All I can do is put you in position to win. Guys, I can't go home with you. I can't be the one that can answer these questions in your life. I can't make the passes in your life. I can't play defense for you. I can't make the shots you need to make. But I can help put you in position to win. And that's what I want to do is I want to be a good coach. So go home. Practice every day. Seek the Lord with all your heart. He will direct your path. Amen? Let's pray. You know, Father, we thank you that you've brought us to this place this morning. And thank you for the rain. Boy, I love the rain. Except when I go backpacking next weekend. <laughs> but you're God and you know what we need. You know, a backpacking trip was on the calendar for a few guys getting together to seek the Lord and fish and do a little bit of hiking. And, and God, you, you know, even, even if the rain comes in, we've got to believe you wanted us to have it. But Father, we thank you for the rain, for the provision in our lives. But mostly, all, mostly above all, Father, we thank you for your Son who came and died on the cross and through his, sacrificial, uh, his sacrifice, Father, we can have salvation. And through the powering of his Holy Spirit, we can have the power to live life. The life that you've given us. So Father, we, we come before you humbly saying, we're going to stop living as the world lives. We're going to become sensitive to your Holy Spirit. Father, our desires of our heart and attitudes of our mind is to be holy and righteous. Father, we're going to stop the lies. We're going to stop the anger. And Father, anywhere where the devil's giving, we're giving the devil a foothold in our lives, we take those places of our lives back and we put them at your feet. Father, thank you so much for being with us this morning. May we recognize your presence as we go throughout the day, as we come back to this place tonight. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Arthur, can, oh, you got one. Thank you. Thank you. Does everybody, every family see one of these? Uh, Betty, we're going to do your thing next week.